goes to Kashmir or used to go to Kashmir in the in the you know in the days of tourism would get these paper mache things, you know, these these boxes made out of compressed paper. And one just thinks of the amount of the you know the newspapers that they would have used to make that. If there was some way in which instead of looking at the painting outside, you could see the newsprint inside. Um, then one would get a sense of uh, how much we need to unravel our understanding of the of memory of history and and of the injustice that's going on in Kashmir and what we as academics, activists, artists can uh, you know can theoretically and practically do about it. So uh, firstly, I want to say that um, I mean I guess you you are aware of the fact that Kashmir is this divided zone and there's this line of control that runs that divides India and Pakistan occupied or administered depending on how you want to look at it sides of Kashmir. And, and the wording is quite precise, it's the line of control, it's Asia's Berlin Wall, you know, it's, it's that thing that divides people, so you, often you have to come on the other side of the world to see somebody who's from the other side of Kashmir because you've not actually seen them, even though, you know, that, that line is literally just, uh, you know, uh, it, it's this, um, it, it's become, of course, now electrified and fenced and all of that. Um, so, so there's that, uh, so it's, it, there's that division, there's been all these wars between India and Pakistan uh, about Kashmir, uh, over the issue of Kashmir. Um, but still, in popular understanding, that Kashmir is projected as either uh, an exotic, beautiful place or a very cruel place with Islamic militants. And especially in, in, in mainstream India, that's, that's a dominant narrative that it's the Muslims, it's the terrorists, it's the insurgents from across the border. Um, or there's this discourse of, will the real victims please stand up, you know? So, um, so uh, it's, it's curious, I mean, Kashmir is obviously uh, the, and uh, you know, since I, I, I'm I'm speaking primarily about India occupied administered Kashmir. So um, the, it's, it's India's Muslim majority state, right? But there is, uh, but there were also the Hindu minority in Kashmir that you know that uh, in the late 80s, early 90s uh, came outside to the rest of India. So what has happened since then, especially in the last 20 years, is that there has been a dual absence produced in the memory and imagination both of Kashmiri Muslims living inside <coughs> Kashmir. Who have you know, and and somebody, a, a Kashmiri friend, was telling me the other day that you know he grew up in this neighborhood that used to be predominantly Hindu, and now he's grew, and and he remembers growing up surrounded by these empty houses where people once used to live. So they, that there's that memory. On the other hand, there's the memory of all these people of the people in Kashmir who've been brutalized, oppressed. Uh, you know, and have been living in a state of occupation for decades now. So the trauma of, of constantly being surrounded by soldiers, by bunkers, by barbed wire, by guns, and, and how all of that just becomes something very quotidian, and the, and the kind of, uh, and as, as we've been talking, the kinds of damage that does to one's, one's life and, and everything in it. Um, so there's, so, so there's, there's that kind of victimhood that, uh, that is seen, you know, it's, it's like there's been a polarization along the lines of religion, along the lines of nation. Uh, and the biggest casualty of that has been what used to be Kashmiriyat, the, you know, a, a significant resource, the common traditions that people in Kashmir, regardless of their religion, used to have, uh, you know, and, and events and occasions that they celebrated and knew about each other. Um, so, so that's, I mean, so there's that. And then there's the, obviously the attempts on the part of, say, the Indian state to normalize the situation by holding a music concert. So there was last year, there was Zubin Mehta's concert within, you know, the world enclosures uh, where ordinary Kashmiris couldn't go and access. So there's, or, you know, events around literature or setting Bollywood movies in Kashmir which, predict, which give you a very predictable uh, narrative about what Kashmir is about. Um, and I think that we need to move, move away from, from all of that to see, the, the, to see Kashmir for what it really is which is the fact that um, the reality of the conflict and of, that, of, of the conflicted imagination that results from it. And one of the things we need to do is, I think, move away from this real politic kind of uh, thing of looking at it as simply as a strategic sensitive issue, which it is like in, in a lot of bureaucratic discourse and army discourse, is that somehow you can't talk up beyond a certain point about the rights and lives of Kashmiris because that is just, you know, that's against, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of against, uh, it's anti-national or it's, it's somehow um, seditious. So uh, activists and politicians and people in India who talk about Kashmir and talk about the rights of Kashmir have to have to be faced with this charge of sedition and odd as it sounds and you know it goes back to 19th century British colonization of India that that's actually still the term that is used sedition that you know what they're doing is sedition um, so there's that and also how stateless subjects these subjects these people who ought to have their political legal moral rights are produced within so-called democratic countries that as as a country that claims a, a, you know to be normatively a democracy that claims to have allegiance to a certain set of notions and functions within the world arena based on that based on that uh, uh, based on that 
how, how it actually produces a certain kind of subject within its own ostensible borders. So the reason I've got these terms, memory, history, injustice, and theory, one after the other, are these big, cumbrous words that have a huge history behind them, histories of hope and despair uh, relating to Kashmiris, is because I think it is important that, you know, the weight of that history, um, so, and, and also I wanted to structure it first by talking about the memory of history, then the history of injustice, and the injustice of theory, so kind of link, link, linking them together. So when I say, uh, so the first thing I want to say is, the, uh, is talk about the memory of history in Kashmir. History and memory, which should run together, actually don't. They often contradict. So the, the Kashmiri uh, American poet Aga Shai Dali often, you know, in his, in his poetry talks about how, you know, uh, one person's uh, history gets in the way of another person's memory. Because depending on who you speak to in Kashmir and what their specific history is, they will have very different nodal points on how they remember what happened and what they think is relevant to, uh, you know, to their life and what, what is the biggest ch challenge that they face. And, and these histories run in conflict, so that there isn't in fact just one Kashmir, but, but there are these many Kashmirs, depending on, you know, on a person's um, class situation, rural or urban situation, depending on whether they are young or old, where have they grown up in the last 20, 25 years, or do they remember Kashmir as it used to be before that. Um, and, and also, without any irony, I mean, even mainstream Indian newspapers, uh, I was reading this report where this person, this young man is being talked about, and, and they say he's inherited separatism from his father, and it was just stated like a, re like a regular thing. But what kind of a place do you live in if you recognize the fact that somebody's inherited separatism? It means that the official logic of the state, that this is just an insurgency thing, doesn't work because his father would have been, al you know, would have been alive decades before. So, so it's... While, while it is convenient to see this as you know, something that's just followed on from the insurgency at the late 80s, early 90s, there are histories of political meddling, of, you know, of people's franchises being restricted, of governments being toppled from the center in post-colonial India that, that have a very strong bearing on this. And, and also, of course, you can go back to the 1940s and before that, when India, when Kashmir was one of those rare places in the Indian map that wasn't very closely integrated into the anti-colonial struggle. Uh, so, you know, while there was this Quit India movement, there was a Quit Kashmir movement in Kashmir. You know, uh, so, so when you look back to the documents of that era, the Naya Kashmir Manifesto and, and that, uh, you know, and that, that sort of a thing, and in the, in the 1950s, uh, in the US it was believed that, that the, the communism, the, the, uh, you know, the, the communism in Kashmir was seen to be a significant threat. So it, it also tied into a whole lot of other Cold War agendas over that period that, that were significant. And I think that's, that's something that if we focus too much on just the recent history, from a status perspective, we forget the longer the longer story behind this, um, and, and 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 but but in in practice, what it does mean is that there is this line. It does divide people. There is there is this Im immense brutal militarization, brutal militarization that, that has happened, and people can't actually go even across the line to meet relatives. They can't. I don't know how much you know about it, but if you see, you would see, and and you know, and or or. Or, or, or places that, that were close to them. It's not just that the Kashmir, Kashmiri youth in the summer of 2010, which was the Intifada, the, uh, you know, Kashmiri Intifada, they weren't just pelting stones at the, at the police. I mean, they were pelting stones. There were the stone pelters, which became an important figure when we look back to 2010. But it's also that across the line of control, people tie letters to stones and throw them across the other side. Because, you know, so it's, it's you, you, and one, one has to look at those artifacts of life to see how, how you know, what, what has been done to this place. So, um, so that's the first part. The second part that is, is about the, is the history of injustice. And, and I think on this, obviously, you, know, you, you only have to go and read about the horrendous statistics of occupation, the humiliations of the arbitrary nature of exercise of power, um, curbing of activity online, people not being able to access telecommunications in this day and age, not being able to use mobile phones freely to contact, uh, you know, to contact people. And little things like a man who's secretly trying to communicate with his girlfriend, goes out on a dress, gets shot by the army because he's thought of as a terrorist. So it's, it's, it's the, the very way in which everyday life is just so completely interpolated with this arbitrary exercise of power. Plus, of course, there is this, uh, there are these laws. So it's not just, it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just, um, Ad hoc, there is a very systematic legal mechanism in place that allows this brutality to continue. So there are these Armed Forces Special Powers Act, uh, Public Safety Act, and these acts in effect <coughs> allow the armed forces to, to literally to get away with murder. So there can be these encounter killings, they can, people can be picked up, and nobody is held accountable. So, so if you look at the statistics of how many, armed, how many people of the armed forces have actually been held to account for anything that they did, including deaths, you won't find any. And even in well-publicized, well-known cases of massacres, rapes, uh, and in spite of you know certain arms of the government themselves saying that this wasn't right, 
people get away. I mean, the most recent example of that is the verdict on a case called Patribal. So you can you can go and read about that. Uh, or last year when Abzal Guru uh, was you know a, a, a Kashmiri, who, he was he was uh, hanged by the Indian state without his family being informed. Uh, on the basis of circumstantial evidence and the court said, the Supreme Court said that this is being done to satisfy the collective conscience of the nation. So there is that and, and on the basis of circumstantial evidence to hang a man and then to, in, to bury him inside the prison and refuse to give his body to his family. Uh, it's, it's, it's that level of just, uh, it's, it's th that's, that's what we are talking about. Uh, of course, in, uh, and, and the tragedy of, of course is that it, it, it wasn't like that. I mean, it, it, Kashmir as part of that whole Central Asian route used to be a zone of contact, not a zone of conflict. Um, but we've forgotten about the fact that it's a peopled place in these exercises of, uh, in, the, in this occupation and this encounter with, uh, with colonial India, with post-colonial India, where two things are important. One, that since the late, since late 80s, uh, well, since early 90s, there's also been this, um, this lib what is called the liberalization in India. So uh, a kind of acceptance of the neoliberal economic consensus, India being a big market. And so there's that. And there's the rise in the last 20 years, especially of hin what is called Hindutva, which is major majoritarian Hindu nationalism in India. And we we'll probably, in a few months when the elections come around, we'll probably see the, the you know, a really horrible effect of that when, uh, you know, when this uh, extremist kind of, uh, this party that is being linked to the, you know, and, and this figure, and you have to read about Modi and Gujarat and the rights and all of that. But, uh, but the idea is that, that as a result of all of that, the Kashmiris are, are the worst bit of the receiving end of it because you know, it also fits into the larger global discourse of Muslim extremists of, you know, of, uh, against a democratic country, against a big market. And, um, and, and the third part, uh, and I, I can, can uh, just, just maybe two minutes. Uh, the third part is, is the bit about injustice of theory. And when I look, look at, at it from theoretically, I mean, obviously as a Kashmiri, but also as an academic. And um, I just think two things are important. One, that there is an irreducible and uh, unavoidable aspect of gender that is involved here. Because, uh, and, and in, in more than one way. So one, there is of course all this, this you know, the way in which women have suffered from the occupation. Uh, and also, and both people displaced people, uh, and, and the way in which the army has used rape systematically in certain villages as, as part of what is, uh, you know, it's not acknowledged war, but as a, you know, just like uh, rape is a war crime kind of a thing. So there is that. There is the, 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 the violence of being done to embodied women. But then there's another representational aspect of gender, which is the way in which when you look at the Indian state and you think, why can't they, some of these things like, you know, the Absal Guru hanging or these verdicts or these, Surely that even goes against one's own uh, interests in us. In, I mean, it just, it's just irrational. So why would they do it? And the reason they do it, and the reason there's this obsessive, psychotic need to possess and control Kashmir on the part of, say, the Indian state, or but equally the Pakistani state, is has to do with a certain kind of masculinist, patriarchal, uh, bureaucratic governmentality of a post-colonial emerging power that, you know, it doesn't matter what, we have to hold on to Kashmir. So it's an integral part of India. It's, it's like this obsession uh, to, to uncompromisingly possess Kashmir. And that has something to do with, if you look at it from a critical geographical point of view and from, from a gender point of view, it has to do with this with this legacy of, of, an, of this irrational need to possess, uh, to possess Kashmir. And because of that, it hasn't acted as a rationalist um, as in, along, along any kind of reasonable uh, way of behavior, but in an incrementalist, completely irrational way with, uh, you know, with, with obviously all these other intended and unintended consequences. And, uh, and as a last point, I mean, I just think theoretically, I find the notion of necropolitics really, really significant here because, um, because sovereignty in, in, the, in, in, in that discourse is, is the power and capacity to dictate who may live and who may die. And I think it is it is that that specific way in which power is exercised, you know, uh, uh, biopower colonies as, as spaces of occupation, where um, where it's to uh, it's it's a kind of territorialization where people are classified, splintered, boundaries are set up, the way in which space itself is organized, and the colonized themselves find themselves something between subjecthood and objecthood. And I think that that within that discourse. Uh, I think theoretically that is uh, along the lines of gender and looking at sovereignty as necropolitics uh, on the part of the way in which the nation states act in Kashmir. I think that that, that conceptualization I would think and that's, you know, that's what I'm working on I think is, is important.